Greetings, everyone, and welcome to LRVS Americas 2023. I'm Douglas Purnell. I will be moderating this session, but let's go ahead and welcome J.D. Solomon, the president at J.D. Solomon Incorporated, as he explains his expertise on how to make your technical presentations accessible and inclusive. It's all yours, J.D. All right. Thank you, Douglas. Can you hear me okay, Doug? Douglas? Yes, yes. Perfect. Sound is good. Okay. Welcome, everybody. I like to start this presentation with JD's rule of 12, which is that for every group of 12 executives, senior management, board members, that level of group you talk with, between one and three of those 12 will have some kind of hearing or visual impairment. And so the choice that you have as a technical professional is do I reach those people and make them my allies? Or do I alienate those people and, and get on their bad foot where they may be against what my message is? So that's the rule of 12. At Finesse, and Finesse is a not-for-profit that I founded about two years ago that's different than J.D. Solomon, Inc. Um, but, but more about Finesse later. But we talk about three barriers to effective communication. One is non-native language. And as technical professions, we deal with people from all over the globe. So you're often dealing with people whose own language is, is not, your first language is not their language. Two, visual and hearing impairment, which we'll talk about today. And then the third, which is very important as well, because there's five generations in the workforce, so we all talk differently, uh, is the generational barriers. So today it's, it's strictly about the visual and hear, hearing impairment, but adding in there with finesse, we also overarch these other barriers in with the approach. So I want to give you eight things today, and I'm going to group them in four groups. Got about 30 minutes, so I want to make sure we have time for questions. So I'll I'll kind of roll through these, but I'm going to give you some examples, and I'm going to give you some, some ways, as the title says, to make your technical presentations. And those are both written reports and visual presentations like PowerPoint, uh, more accept, accessible and inclusive. So the first place I start is a group and communication is a system. So I can group these three together because they exist independently and they feed off of each other or complement each other um, by the way they work together. Uh, so I'll talk briefly about color selection. I'll talk about symbols and icons and I'll talk about contrast, the first step. So the first thing, if you can see colors is that we talk a lot of finesse about which colors are more powerful than others and how does a technical professional register the message with senior management. So takeaway here is that blacks and dark blues are always effective. They're colors of authority, they're colors of finality. It's one reason why the Grim Reaper death is black. It's a lot of reasons the bottom line is sometimes black. It's why Police cars are black and blues or black and whites and blues and whites. So those are always safe colors to have. And your dark green is a good color too. The other colors can get lost. The other colors are mainly for highlights. Um, and there's another drawback to this. This is simply with grayscale. So what you can, if you can read that slide, then this slide, you can see that the colors really don't matter. And so what you think the effect may be in color is totally different when it's black and white. And so if you're colorblind or have glaucoma or some kind of other eye condition, you're probably not going to see the colors in the way that other people see the colors. And so you need to think about that as you put your information graphics together. Here's an example from North Carolina where I'm based, one of my, one of my state offices in North Carolina, one's in South Carolina but from North Carolina DEQ. And you can see a slide concerning PFAS, which is a, a probably a, a, one of the most popular contaminants to talk about these days. Uh, but you can see their pretty graph that they're very proud of that exists in colors. The problem with that is what I just said, if you turn it to a grayscale, then you lose all of the colors and all of the, the message that you're trying to get across with the colors. What would have been better is that instead of using colors would have been to use different shapes 
and so the different colors. And for those who may be on the call that have some form of color blindness, one of the rules is to use shapes, not colors. Incidentally, one of the things as a presenter that you need to think about is when you stand behind a podium and point and say, see the light blue or see the darker blue, people with color blindness may not be able to see the blues at all. And so you've got to kind of stricken even the color out of some of the language you use when you're presenting the groups. I mentioned symbols and they're all over the place, right? Departments of transportation use different kind of symbols, shapes of signs in with color. So the point I make there is, just as I said before, don't strictly use the same shape with different colors, change your shapes. OSHA or internationally, any kind of occupational safety signage would come in different icons, even though those are black and white and red, but they'll use their icons with the diamond. And if you do business process mapping on the left, there's also shapes that are used like for decisions and process uh, squares, uh, not just colors. And finally, on the right, Google itself uses icons and shapes as well as colors. In fact, what you can see here is what we'll lead into in just a second is contrast. So most of your great maps, whether they're hand-drawn maps or machine-drawn maps or computer maps, we use a lighter pastel in the background so that the icons and the colors will really bounce off to the things you need. And so another example uh, here of how shapes and symbols should be used uh, over strictly colors. Now, another one's from my friends at DEQ because I had I have many slides. We do these communicating with finesse, and I do these critique slides for people before presentations and after, kind of as a service, but to really make it better. These were some slides that I was part of a review doing. And uh, what you can see is, and I understand this as a technical professional, we had a table, and, and for those who can see the yellow highlights there, uh, we the, the, the author of the presentation, the PowerPoint, just cut out some tables and colored the areas that he wanted the audience to see, and it was a heat. However, again, when I take that to, to more of a grayscale color, for those that could have seen the yellow before, now you can't see the contrast. And so all it would have taken was, instead of using a strict yellow color for a highlight, a little bit more effort to put an icon or an X or a check or whatever you want to do, so that the audience who may have a visual impairment uh, could clearly see the, the the places on the tables that you wanted uh, them to see. Contrast checkers are available in Adobe, in Google, and Microsoft. Uh, you may or people ask me sometimes, does Adobe have these? And the answer is yes. If you look through your menus, you will see accessibility checkers. And usually within the accessibility checkers uh, is always is a contrast checker. Google has it in all your Microsoft projects. So it's available to you. It's really just a matter of how you use it. Now, the other place to check, if you can go to a, a lot of uh, online sources, I like the one at Utah State University. I think I've lost my um, graph here or my, my website connection. Uh, but I can send this to you if anybody wants the, the, the web address for Utah State. But basically what you see on the right is the contrast checker they use. And that is J.D. Solomon Inc.'s blue color, 14294B, compared to white. And you can see the ratio is 14.49 to 1, which the contrast, usually by international standards, needs to be 4.5 to 1. And so this is just a way to check when you start having yellows and greens and oranges and different colors of blue. Do you have the right contrast for people that have some kind of visual impairment? Again, just like I said in the beginning, the decision you have to make is, are you going to try to win that 8 to 25% of your audience over, or do you risk losing them or alienating? And I think it just takes a little more effort to run these checks and to do it in that way so that you keep them. All right. I want to stop. Let me see if I've got, okay. Let me stop here. Douglas, do we have any comments or questions from anyone? 
Uh, at this point, we have uh, someone writing in from Sonia saying that's a good point on your last on your last uh, point. You st I say it. Very good. So I'll keep rolling. Just want to take a breath and make sure if you've got any questions or on any of that information, um, my, uh, ask me now or we can uh, uh, you'll have my email address on the back slide as you get these. Okay, let's move into the second class here for this 30 minute presentation, uh, which is font size and font type. And incidentally, I do a whole half day training on this. So I'm, I'm kind of compressing all this information into a few slides for you guys. Hopefully it's not too fast, um, but hopefully also giving you some good examples. So there is a relation between font size and font type. And we'll go with font size first. So, Go to the right first, and this is off some website I don't have the address written down on, but there is an X height. And usually the larger the X height, which is those lowercase letters, the more readable, more readable the text is. So when you're looking for fonts or you're looking for size, you're trying to maximize that X height. Now your default kind of best practices, which are there on the left, are based really on eight and a half by 11 paper. And they're also based on PowerPoint slides that are like five by five, five lines and five words or eight lines and eight words, that kind of matrix. And that's where this comes from. But the, the, the technical part that's behind it is, is the X height. So while the X height here on the left gives you some standard fonts, sizes, if you were using smaller paper or bigger, sizes and your X factor may be a little bit different depending on how you compress things. Bottom line here is the message on the bottom is most of your commercial software and your corporate standards, whether you're public sector or private sector, have these fonts set up on the left uh, for you to work with. Now, you're all our technical professionals like I am. And so what we tend to do Again, a real life slide is we tend to cram too much information onto our slides. And in this case, they were talking about PFAS again. And I know where they were coming from. They were trying to get all the information to minimize slides, as we all do at some point. And the result is something that's not really readable, especially to people with some form of disability or impairment. So one of the things we look for when we do these screening is we use two sizes of fonts. Which, which may be an indicator outside of your title that you're starting to use too many. In this case, they actually use four different uh, font sizes, 16, 18, 20, and 24, which is a big red flag. There's also 16 lines of text here, which probably means it needed to be two slides, not one, or maybe it didn't even need to be a slide. We just crammed too much in. Um, and we see a lot of bullets. In other words, the, subliminally, we are already saying this could be jumbled because we've crammed too much on the slide and might not be read, re readable. So we're adding bullets. Um, the lesson on bullets is you don't need bullets if you're using the right distribution of words on the page. Um, the thing that's good here is it is using an aerial font. Okay. So that's all about font size and how it works with the X factor and the X height and how things work together. We talk about font type. These by default are the best three. And by best, I mean for people with visual um, challenges, for people that have learning disabilities, um, people that even dyslexia, these type of fonts are best. And what you're really looking for among the suite of fonts is sans serif. The so sans serif is the fonts that don't have the little tick marks uh, on the F's and the T's and, and those type of letters. Um, Times Roman is an example of a serif font with those little ticks, and that's hard to read and hard to comprehend with, with visual impairments. So we stay with Arial, Helvetica, usually for a dark background, and Calibra, which is the default of Microsoft Office. Again, you usually do a pretty good job if you stay with what Google and Microsoft and Adobe kind of bring to you. It's when you try to get really creative or stand out that you start running into problems inadvertently um, 
with your audience when you try to do something a little too cute. So this is from the PFOS presentations. Again, there was three of them, so I cut these out for you. Um, the left two are two different presentations from NCDEQ. They used an aerial text, which is good. Um, in, in those two on the left in the body, um, it's a sans serif. It's, it's probably universally good. The lesson here is they use the Time New Romans in the heading. But this is the department's default heading recommended guideline. And so I like this slide because it reminds me to tell you that sometimes your corporate departments or your branding departments do this intentionally or they do it by mistake but it's not your job to lose your job over trying to correct the people that think they're the experts of this. What you really need to be careful of is go with the standard style and then as a technical professional, make sure that you're using the good practice that you know how to do, um, which is the sans serif font with the right distribution. And then finally on the right, you see one from North Carolina State University. And again, what I love about it is it's all Calibra, it's sans serif, you see no bullets, and you see there are about seven lines of text, uh, three of which are indented and no bullets. So a very good practice here for readability. All right, Douglas, any questions? I'm going to keep rolling if you got nothing. And no questions at this point. And you can hear me. Okay. So these next, this third suite, um, we'll go through a couple of slides kind of fast maybe here, but these are really three two areas, but three big things here that I see the most problems with most technical reports and especially report presentations. So get into the money slides here. Alternative text, most of you know what alternative text is because you get an object, you get a visual, the fault they tend to ask you, give me the alt text. Alt text is really to help people with assistive devices, which have either reading or hearing problems, visual problems, or as most of you also probably know, all your web searches are using the alternative text to try to help classify what you've got behind the scenes. And so good, well-written alternative text is powerful not only for your readers and your, your people you're presenting to, but it's also power for your SEO on your digital searches on the internet. Rule number one here is to use alt text to express the message of what you're trying to convey in the object. And so in this case, you may say, if I've got a good label on my image, why can't I just use that? And I say, you can. Make sure that has a good message on it though. And you usually can put a lot more information in the alt text than just that. But if nothing else, that's an easy way to make sure your alt text is right. What you don't want to say is lady standing in trees because that has no message in it. You need to have a good call text that says, what is the message that you want the person with the visual or hearing impairment to get from the object that they really can't see that. The other one is just to acknowledge quickly that there are certain visuals you will use that are purely decorative. And we as technical professional primarily provide information type graphics and visuals, but occasionally we need a decorative graphic. You can also mark those as decorative um, in your different, whether it's Google, Adobe, uh, or Microsoft, they'll let you mark those as decorative and they'll have no messages on them. Okay? They're meaningless to people that can't see them. So some common errors. Um, that we have on the next piece, which is reading order. And I'll show you how these all fit together in the next slide. Reading order, headings, and groupings is, you can read that yourself, but we get down to common eras. I do it sometimes when I get rushed. We use bold text instead of a heading format. In tables, we use the bold text instead of a heading format. And on slides, we just don't put a heading at all. We need more space, so we don't put a heading. Remember, your assistive devices need to know the order of what your tables and your text say, and that's why you use the heading features to kind of show the parent-child or that nested relationship. And so I'm going to go to a slide uh, here from another PFAS study. This is the NC State study. 
the slide is in front of you, the reading order is on the right, and you see that slide for somebody that can't see and using a assistive device has 18 different objects in it. You go, wait a minute, JD, that doesn't look like 18 different objects to me, but for somebody that can't see it well and needs some help, that's 18 different ones. All I have to do is group that, right? And that's effective for your presentation size. And I take 18 down to four. Now I can add a message on what I want somebody to understand from the graph. Because otherwise, if you don't put your message on it in alternative text, then you're leaving it up to their imagination on what to determine. I go down to the bottom right and I go, oh, that looks like a messy logo. I group it. Now I'm down to three things. If I make that logo decorative, now I'm down to two. So now from that one slide and all the complexity in it, I have the slide heading with a message. I have the graphic with a message. As a presenter, I only have two things, two messages I need to say. So this is a way that we make our presentations more concise and also easier for people with hearing or visual impairments to, to comprehend. Here it is in a table the same way. The point I like to make here in a table, um, this is not mine, but I can say I, admit I do it as a technical professional. When you just bold it, you get tons of errors when you start checking it for accessibility because there is no spatial order to it from an assistive device. And I would add, if we, and I've done this before, if we look at any table with the people on the call, there's probably four places that people start what we see is at least four. And so some people start with columns, some with rows, some at the top, some on the bottom right. So as a presenter, you don't want people to spend two or three minutes trying to understand a table of where to start. You want to go ahead and, and group that and put a good message with it uh, in alternative text, which would help you to, to do the headings. And the headings also show you where the nesting is. The eighth piece I give you as I get near the end here uh, is assistive listening devices. And I think the story here is that in the old days, and I've got a little bit of gray hair, white hair I've got sometimes, is we were told, turn your cell phones off and turn your computer off while some presentation come on. I will tell you, just like getting out of the habit of saying, look at that shade of blue versus this shade of blue, get out of the habit of telling people not to use the devices. If you go to your, to your app, wherever your store is, download, live transcribe. This is great for interpreting anything that's said from about 100 feet away in 70 different languages. And it's deadly accurate from an AI perspective. Uh, and I encourage people in a lot of my presentations when I start to offer this to say, if you've got some issue with seeing or hearing or you may have a challenge, it's okay download this or use this and JD will not say anything to you because I want you to not be alienated or put off by what I'm saying because you can't understand it. I want you to fully be able to observe it as we go. So this live transcribe is a great, great device. And there's several articles on our website about actual real world cases where this has really turned around people's lives, not just from a professional standpoint, but if you're challenging someone at home, uh, this can turn around your kids or your spouse's world by being able to see better or, hear, or being able to hear better. So these are the eight ways that I went through. I think you guys will have a copy of these slides and you'll have this as a recording. Uh, I come to my big finish to give you a couple. Again, the rule of 12 uh, between one and three people and every audience you have at a senior management level will have some kind of hearing or visual impairment. Your choice is whether to bring them in or to potentially put them off. Um, there are three things in finesse that we talk about and today that are barriers to effective communication. Today I talked about the visual and hearing impairment piece of it. And in the greater perspective of the three fins of finesse, Finesse is the is a cause and effect relationship. There's your fishbone diagram or your issue collar diagram. Frame, illustrate, noise reduction, empathy, structure, synergy, and ethics. And at the end of the day, as technical professionals, this is a great model because not only is it cause effect, but it puts the priorities where it needs to be. 
that top fin is on data and information. That's what we do. That's what we got to know best. The second piece is bottom fin. There's a lot of what I, some of the things I talked about today. It's how do you cater this to your audience or your context? And then finally, it's all got to be driven by your ethics and your health. And at communicating with finesse, the non not for profit piece of this, this is what our group, our community does um, to try to help technical professionals be better and more effective communicators and facilitators uh, in group settings. So with that, that's my 30 minute shotgun uh, presentation. And uh, I think I got about five minutes or so left. So I'll throw it back uh, to my moderator and let him tell me if there's any questions. I'll say it right now. That was that was definitely a great topic. I never even thought about a lot of things you were speaking on. But um, before I ask my questions, I have there's a question from Chloe Smith. Uh, she writes such an important topic that is not discussed enough for presentations. One question I would ask is, would you recommend any type of transition slash animated slides or would you avoid it at all costs? Typically, I avoid them. We're we're in a serious we're in a serious business. Our job as trusted advisors, as technical professionals, is to present somebody that's allocating resources or making decisions with information. Um, as a default, I like to be short, sweet, and to the point, and let them ask me questions. Like everything in business, there's two sides though, and so if I know my audience and I know certain people like a little bit of animation or a little bit of transition. I'll throw it in there and it's helpful. It is helpful, like a decorative graphic, but what you don't want to do is have it distract from the message. So I, I usually try to avoid any form of distraction if I can. So that's a short answer to a long question, I guess. Long answer to a short question. Chloe, did that answer that for you? I'll wait until, until I see something, but now I have a, a question. So I deal heavily with, with Spectra from time to time, right? So how would you how would you say will be the best approach for Spectra, right? So if you're using FTIR, it's kind of, yeah, you, you can always say, oh, we're going to change the colors and everything else. But what what else could we really do? Because a lot of the software is, is older. It doesn't really have that ability to, you know, have dotted lines or lines with symbols inside of it. What would you recommend? Um, you're younger, you're more dynamic. I would actually find the people that write the code and say, let's make it better. There are international standards for this, like web-based standards. And if they're not living up to the standards, they should be able to change that. I will tell you, I do a lot of Monte Carlo simulation and at risk. And when the former owner of, of, of Palisade at risk was alive, I talked to him about using too much red and green. He said, we never thought about it. It's kind of like Chloe said, oh, we've never, we've been doing it this way for 15 years and never thought about it. And I said, well, you need to change it or talk to some people with visual difficulties and get that right. If they don't, they don't. But I think yeah. that's your first, that's your first step is to take that extra initiative as a technical professional and get your software vendors right. Because my goodness, we're doing it right in so many other fields. Why do we accept ex inferior software as engineers and other technical? You shouldn't. So. Okay, and let's say for for the different symbols, right? So I know we can. Everyone can say, okay, we're just gonna go into insert in in uh, Microsoft. And say, okay, we're gonna put this symbol for this, this one for that, right? So what happens? Let's say if someone is using a uh, different version of Word, or say they're using um, the Google version, right? And the symbol doesn't translate over. Have you run into that issue where the symbols aren't really, like they, it might mess up or show up as like a block? Yeah, I have before, and they do. And that's something you, you've got, just got to judge what's the greater evil. And mm -hmm. for me, what I typically do, let me start off by saying this, before I give any presentation or report, I give it to my audience in advance. And I usually do it in Word, PowerPoint, either one, and Adobe. So I'm already looking at that in advance. And what giving it to people in advance does is when it helps you check it. But also people with disabilities or whatever it is, that gives them time to absorb it. It's respectful, right? 
and you're not throttling your decision maker. So it's going to happen. It, 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 it happens less now than it used to happen, quite honestly. But but you just got to make that trade off. And I, I like to just check it by giving stuff to people early and making sure it's right before I send it. But uh, time is our enemy. And, and I know that's the case, Douglas. Sometimes you just do stuff and throw it and it doesn't translate well. Yes. But, um, you know, I get it. But I just I, I think that's the, the answer is just make the trade off yourself. We get back to Chloe. You're not aware of what you said. You weren't even aware of some of this stuff. Now that you're aware of it, you can make the trade-off decisions, right? Got anything else? Okay, so we're almost near near the end. So I have one one last thing I want to ask you, right? So is there anything you would like to give us that you did not cover in your slides today? Um, Man, there's a lot I could give you. I would just say this. Study your soft skills like you do your hard skills. That's one thing I see out there through my career is that we get so focused on the hard skills and, and figuring out what we learn in academia means in practice that we get to be 50 years old and you go, wow, I wish I was a better communicator or a better facilitator. Take this stuff as serious as you do your technical stuff. And man, your careers will just boom, whether it's your first career or your second career. This is really the key to making your career go boom and go boom. Big time, not not just. I'm a technical guy, so I love the technical stuff. But you got to be able to communicate, and that's what I would need. Do do the look at the soft skills. Okay. Well, once again, JD, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to speak at LRVS and speak to all of us about your topic. Um, I look forward to seeing you again, and um, everyone, thank you for coming to this session, and uh, have a good day. All right. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you, everybody. Thank y'all.